it's one of the more remarkable stories. I've spent a lot of time in Yekaterinburg, which is a city created in months. And it's, it's astonishing that they could even do it. So this kind of creating industry in Siberia and so forth, they really don't pull off, but almost everything else they do. The truth of the matter is there's enormous optimism in this first five-year plan, as I've already indicated. They set insane targets. We've talked about it around agriculture. And then they go one step further, and they will say that uh, essentially we will, we will make the five-year plan uh, reduce it to a four-year plan. They'll take these impossible targets, and they will set them for a four-year plan. And in order to accomplish this, and they feel that they do, uh, they have to do all sorts of things around at the local level, around cooking numbers, faking numbers, and impossibly poor production levels, for impossibly poor. Uh, uh, Stephen Kotkin, who writes this book, uh, looking at Magnetic Mountain, looks at the great city of Magnitogorsk, uh, and uh, as part of the first five-year plan, it's not only to construct a city out of nothing in Magnitogorsk. Magnitogorsk would translate as magnetic mountain. But they're to create these, uh, these massive chimneys for the production of something that may or may not be connected to pig iron. I don't even know. It's smelting and something. They need chimneys. It's a massive kind of chimney works. They do construct them ahead of the time frame for the first five-year plan. It allows the first five-year plan on that level to be a success. The only drawback is it's so poorly constructed they can never use it. So it's kind of, and there's a way in which this happens all the time around production and production quotas. And it's there throughout. 1980s, when we bought light bulbs living there, when they took out uh, every light bulb you buy in a store, they would take it out of the package before you paid for it and had a little kind of container on the counter in which they test to see if it works. Now, when you buy a light bulb here, you never do that. You never do that because you've got to, you think they're going to work. It has a lot to do with production targets more than actual, uh, actual competencies within the system. There are problems then around the, uh, of what's going on. Uh, there's also the second problem is that because it's not a police state that's tightly run in which people are are actually le leading lives in which they're, they're being monitored, some sort of GPS system. In fact, the population is mu it's a much more chaotic pace of growth than what's happening. Everything is going in a kind of frantic way, in a way that makes it incredibly unrealistic. To make Magnitogorsk, uh, they have uh, these massive plans in Moscow in which they, they design the perfect city. They, and did I talk about this already in class? No, I just they never know when I'm always reliving my life over again. Uh, so they bring these plans for the perfect city to Magnitogorsk, and what do they find? The city's already been made because they've been dumping people off at railway crossings, a siding, for, uh, for months already, and the people haven't just waited in the snow. They've built homes. They've built homes in relation to the mines that have begun. And so this well-planned society is, in fact, enormously chaotic. Uh, there are stories told in, in uh, Magnitogorsk, in Magnetic Mountain, of uh, where people get off the train and the, the doors open of the train in the snow-filled wilderness. And the population says, someone says, where's Magnitogorsk? And the official uh, on the train ordering them out says, it's right here in four years. That's part of the kind of frantic madness that's underway at all of this. Well, you have scarce resources initially, <coughs> Uh, this long-term viability I've already mentioned. And every time the system kind of breaks down like this, the state has a choice to make. And the choice it can make is either that the state screwed up with its planning or that there are terrorists around. They'll pick terrorists every day of the week because it's a lot better than admitting that the plans were unrealistic. Uh, the first projects, I'll just indicate them here for you. Magnitogorsk I've talked about, which is actually in Siberia. It's actually on the other side of the Ural Mountains. Uh, and, um, and the other project is Dnepastroy. Dnepastroy is one of the great dams across um, the Dnepr River. It's actually kind of in Ukraine. Thanks. Uh, it's actually in Ukraine. Uh, my mother was raised sort of half an hour away from this dam and remembers the stories of its construction from her childhood, which was sort of neat, except that some of the stories they were told at the time, which would be true, is that they, they were in such a hurry to build it, they would have people stomping down the concrete at the bottom of the, the, uh, the dam as they'd be pouring it in. 
but uh, they wouldn't have time to get them out of the way always before the next batch was dumped into the into the dam. Uh, and, uh, and so that was also part of what was happening. Uh, this is a, a, a contrast between the promise and the reality of what unfolds within a collective eye, within industrialization. On the one hand, you have a notion that industrialization is going to bring a broadening out of range of, of activities that are available within the societies. The good life and sort of physical fitness and schools, uh, uh, um, uh, nurseries, uh, kindergartens, uh, uh, stalovaya, stalovaya uh, canteens, cafeteria kind of things, uh, uh, participation of women in the socialist, in the construction of socialist society. And it has this, the, the posters always communicate the kind of orderliness and success. And the state does industrialize massively. This is one of the stats that Kotkin gives us of Magnitogorsk people coming and going. They're astonishing numbers. Because this is a society that moves. If this is true, and it most surely is, then it's a society that's just hard to pin down. You can't keep track of 97,000 showing up in 31 or disappearing in 31 and going off to other places and so forth and so on. It is a kind of chaoticness that's there. And I really want to get to um, the other issue. But it has, he also captures this contrast, and I will stop at this. There's a really great summary in the textbook, and I also have it on this um, set of slides as to how you actually weigh this all out, because it does industrialize. That's the irony of it. It does pull this thing off, but it's in a kind of frantic, disorganized, semi-chaotic sort of madness. This is the picture, a home, a living, and a trade uh, establishments, that kind of world. Those are the posters that are coming out and the kind of expectation of what people have. This is the reality, again, out of Kotkin. In the barracks, mud and ceaseless noise. Not enough light to read. The library's poor. Newspapers are few. The stolen to roll cigarettes. Gossip, obscene anecdotes, and songs emerge from the mud-filled red corners. At nights, drunks return to the barracks, stupid from boredom. They disturb the sleep of others. Kotkin's study is not about that this is all a pathetic waste and destructiveness and so forth. It's really a kind of heroic story, but it's heroic in an odd way. It's not heroic as in the state pulling off what it does, because in a way it does and it doesn't, and hundreds of thousands will die. But it's heroic because people living in this setting, in the mud and in the squalor, made sense of their lives, lived in that setting. It's, a, it's kind of a remarkable story in a lot of ways. Any, uh, and that's all we, uh, I'm going to shift over now, but are there any questions about that? I want to say, uh, I was thinking of it last week, or after Tuesday, that when when I ask a question and people answer, and even if it's not quite the answer I'm looking for, I'm keenly aware of the, um, it's, uh, in a sense, the courage it takes to, to, to respond to a question in a setting like this. So I, uh, I commend you uh, for that, for, uh, for when I ask a question. First half of the 1930s is chaotic. It's built around, uh, and millions will die, millions will die, and the, um, they will die through collectivization, industrialization, and the chaos around decolonization and so forth. And it's, uh, and it's not to justify any of it, but it's of a different kind of killing. And one has to make a distinction to make sense of the, not to begin to make sense of the 1930s. Something very different will define the second half of the 1930s. It will be less famine in the countryside, less the kind of death around the industrialization. It will be very much rooted in political decisions and um, uh, imprisonments and executions.